Greetings and welcome uh, to this video. This should be a somewhat brief video where I'd like to, to comment on a few cases and uh, perhaps give some updates and a little bit of explanation where it might be necessary. So uh, please feel free to add your questions uh, here in the chat. Try to get to as many as I can. Uh, oftentimes I'm asked questions I can't answer. Uh, but I'd like to give it a try. If, if it's in the language, then I might be able to address it. Um, so this is a place for um, deception detection. Uh, that's what I do. I'm rather limited in what I do. Uh, if I work on a case with law enforcement, I don't comment on it publicly and I don't write on it publicly. So whenever you hear me talking about a case here, uh, unless a case is adjudicated and the um, appeals have run out and law enforcement has given me the okay, um, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm going to stick only to public cases. And there's a couple here I wanted to address. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the uh, Grant Solomon case, the young man who died when a, his pickup truck rolled over on him. And it was ruled an accident. And um, I took a look at the 911 call. I, I've got the links up there for you for the 911 call and for a new article that just came out from the Daily Mail that I think I, I might be able to put up, put up for you. Let's see. I think it's, it's useful and um, in terms of what the family is doing to bring attention to this, I think it's terrific in that sense. Um, you may or may, may not be a fan of the Daily, Daily Mail. I go wherever I can get quotes, um, mostly for the uh, in terms of journalism. I follow independent journalists. I think X is a great place for that. Uh, but I go to wherever I can find quotes, I go there. But this was from July 20th, 2020. He was a, a young man that appeared to have a very bright future in front of him. And his father was meeting him. And um, he was killed beneath the truck. So the father called 911, our emergency line, for those of you that are in the, the UK or Europe, it's our emergency line. And in that call, I concluded that he was withholding information. And that's something I'd like to just give a brief explanation to. And, and you can read the analysis. It's, it's simple analysis, but um, when someone's withholding information, there's information that they have they are thinking of and they're not sharing. And so th there's signals within a language that show that someone is uh, concealing information. For me, the problem has been that I don't know if it is guilt directly related to the death or if we, what we call attendant guilt. I can't, I, I'm not able to tell just from that alone um, if, if I had transcripts to his interview, that would be different uh, to see how that went. But he doesn't show a priority of saving his son's life. And it does indicate for missing information. Now, what I mean by attendant guilt is let's uh, do a, a scenario where someone shoots a man and the man dies in the street. Another man comes along and robs the body. They're both going to show guilt, but what I can't tell, always, unless there's more interview or, or an in-depth call, is if the guilt is from the shooter or someone who came along and robbed the body. They're both gonna show guilt and they're both gonna show likely deception. Neither wants to get caught. That sometimes is much more complicated than what I could explain here. Uh, attendant guilt. It can be where a child goes missing and 
the parent is lying about it, not because the parent killed the child, but because the parent was, in this one case, uh, under the influence of drugs. And the child got out of the home because of the neglect. And so the obviously the adult is responsible and the deception is there, but um, I can't say that the person uh, killed the child directly. I can say that the person is withholding information there. The person is not being truthful. The person is not being candid. And so that's the, the case I find here with um, the Solomon case, Grant Solomon's case. Uh, so if you get a chance, I have the link up there for you. Take a look at that, the Daily Mail. I think it's um, very useful to uh, to look at. And then back to the other screen here. Back to my notes here. So there's the link to the, the uh, 911 call, the emergency call, a simple analysis you can look at, you know, link to explanations. And then there's the Daily Mail article. Um, and before I touch upon Madeline McCain and the block analysis and Sebastian Robbins, um, I, th I thought it might be good for me to explain this. Just a something I have to do in terms of social media. Um, I don't personally engage in, in many comments um, and questions when it's you know more advanced or nuanced analysis. And it's not because I don't I, I wish to be rude or elitist or that I consider people that, that you know they can't grasp something. The, the difficulty I run into is time, is that there are certain points of nuance that take a long time to explain. It's easier on a video, of course, than it is in typing on social media. But the, just the rule of thumb that I follow that uh, with advanced analysis, I, I hope no one takes offense at, but it is about time, is that when someone asks a, a, a more detailed or a, a more difficult question regarding some more of the advanced analysis, um, I generally don't engage unless I know the person has had formal training um, because the explanation becomes very long and it's also often based upon previous understandings. And so unless I, I understand about what their background is, it could be this endless cycle of having to explain, explain, explain over, over different principles um, that are in play and then the context. And if they don't have experience in the context, it, it can be very difficult. So uh, I hope that will not be interpreted as rudeness, but as uh, time and, and practicality. I also, I, I don't engage in um, anyone that's presenting as an anonymous. I understand there's reasons why people will do things anonymously um, but when it comes to formal training and that sort of thing, and then putting out um, information, it was very important to me in the early days that my name was there because I'm responsible for the opinion I'm giving. And I know there's times when people are much more comfortable being anonymous, but anonymity also allows for a lack of accountability um, the inability to be challenged, I think. But also it, it can allow for emotionalism and sensationalism to take over. And that's something I, I, I don't wish to engage in. So um, in terms of getting involved with, with um, answers to what can be pretty complex questions, things that I have to really stop and think about. Um, I'd like to, to keep that to someone that's had formal training and someone that is standing upon their own name. You know, this is who I am. And if I'm wrong, then I need to be corrected. And of course, there's, there's ways around that. Um, 
vague answers and and that sort of thing. And um, and actually, it can it can borderline on some areas where um, the deception is pretty plain, but there's a lack of commitment given regarding that. Uh, so I, I just, this is my personal choice. It's it's too time consuming um, and it can be a little bit frustrating with that. Now in the training, and here's the critical point about that. So if someone enrolls in training and yeah, I work with them, but eventually under the right conditions, the greatest training that I've received has been um, what we call team analysis training. And what this is, it's if someone qualifies for that, they're put with a dozen or more professionals. And it's all around the world and it's done uh, live uh, through like Zoom-like settings, you know, online. And it's there that I have met over the years people that are much smarter than me, people with very varied backgrounds, um, people who bring things to the analysis that challenge me. And it's it truly is iron sharpening iron. And so an opinion that comes out um, of those things is really something that's defended and presented well. And so if, if someone is interested in training, um, there's, not, there's not a guarantee that you'll be invited to a team analysis training. And there is some good trainings going on, including in the United Kingdom, which is a different time zone than where I am. Uh, Paul, if he's here today, he's someone that uh, great to get in touch with like that if you enroll in, in you know, formal training. Um, Steve Johnson on the West Coast here in the United States does great work with that. Um, so there's a, a number of places that, that offer really good training, but it's you have to be put with professionals. And like a chess match, you want to play against people that are better than you. And that, uh, I, I, it's been invaluable for me learning, being with people with different backgrounds and smarter than me. And it also has a little bit to do with the McCann case, which I'll comment on. Um, so if someone enrolls in training, so you say, well, how can I be part of one of those type of groups? Um, to be enrolled in training, the work has to be good to be to gain an in, invitation, but also the personality. Here's why. Um, and this is another reason why that going anonymous is not helpful, is if someone has an emotional reaction to being disagreed with. They're not going to work out. They, they, it's just not for them. They're not a good person or a bad person because it's just a personality thing um, where someone saying, no, that's incorrect. Here's a different view. If that elicits a response that says, I don't work well with others, or I don't like to hear different opinions, um, they won't work well in a team. It, it'll frustrate them. It'll frustrate the team. It'll hinder growth and that sort of thing. We we embrace it. We look for it. Uh, we enjoy it. Um, sometimes we laugh over it. It's of great value. And then there's also the um, the confidentiality of this work. Uh, myself, Paul, Steve, others, they have to be very careful with um, who receives an invitation. If someone um, is going to take that information and then go public with it, it could jeopardize a case. So uh, real names, real training, real results. Um, the iron sharpening iron is is just excellent. And there here's some more advantages. Uh, we had finished a very long marathon on the murder of Sophie Duplantier in Ireland. And there was so much that uh, was offered to us by Sophie's family, which meant those whose first language is French were able to help us with that. And then there was much that came from Steve Foote and others that worked privately like a subset team, 
of nuance uh, of expressions and culture in Ireland that are very different than here in the United States. Um, I was doing a training one time in Switzerland and someone asked a, a very intelligent question about interviewing. Um, and his experience was in terms of interviewing uh, in Germany. And he said, that, you know, Germans are not like the Americans in terms of freely sharing information. And so you have to tap into human nature and you've got to adjust for the culture. Um, it's not just block analysis in terms of the second language, but it's also culture and expressions. We talk about the use of the word child in analysis. And, and then there are some cultures that use child to describe anyone that they have either raised or given birth to. So we have to be very flexible and there, there's much to draw with context. There are some things that I may have more experience than someone else. They have more experience than me in this area, that area. So it's very context dependent. And as you can imagine, as I build all this up, um, someone asking a cold question about something that is that deep, you can probably imagine how long it would take to explain. So the training is, is invaluable. There's also plenty of training that um, can be engaged in simply as a civilian, so to speak. Someone who just wants to increase their discernment, their understanding of being lied to, that sort of thing. Um, and that's good. A lot of people do that. Uh, some journalists do it. And uh, I think it improves their, their reporting quite a bit. Um, so this it's just many, many layers. And like human nature itself, it's, it is complex. And then, of course, at the end of the day, there's always someone who is just so strange and odd that it's very difficult to figure out. And they seem to break all the rules. And that's part of human nature. Um, regarding the German prosecutors, this is this kind of a lead in with that. Um, Block analysis, that's a nickname I gave it because what I picture is little building blocks, you know, children's toys, building blocks, one upon the other. And that in order to analyze a second language, because it's always best in the first language, first culture, is to step back. And instead of looking close, like a, as if we're putting a microscope on a word, looking back saying, no, I'm going to miss nuance in the translation. I'm going to miss it. So let me just look at some of the more dominant themes in the language. Um, one of the things I recommend to people to do is to, there's books out that have a lot of the transcripts to the Nuremberg trials, uh, 1947, for example, 46, 47, um, that are fascinating of course, uh, of historic, great of historical importance, but allows someone to practice um, working from a translation. And they always have to be reminded, don't look too deep, don't look too close, step back, try to get a general picture. You can, you can picture a priority, for example, of what someone talks about or the absence of what they, they seem to be withholding. Um, with the German prosecutors and update on the Madeleine McCann case, it, it becomes almost... Uh, absurd at this point, or perhaps it is absurd, where every so often they bring out something and the media rushes to show it. And they've focused on Christian Bruckner. And I, I humorously posted, but it was from years ago, where they, um, some investigators had posted, hey, if you were in Portugal, X amount of years ago, and you purchased marijuana, we want to hear from you. Um, and that truly is clickbait. The German prosecutors, um, even with the block analysis, they did not believe their own words. They did not believe their own words. And it was PR stunt after PR stunt. And Christian Bruckner is an obvious easy target, a long-term criminal. Um, and then they have the, the interviews from another long-term criminal that, that used to know him. And, um, 
But what did bother me more than just the usual churning was when they claimed to have evidence of her death. And so the question would be, why would you bring this to the public and not to court? We know she died, but we can't prove it. So how do you know? That seems like it's, they're just going to die very slowly. And it, it appears to me that the publicity stunt is people are getting tired of it and um, the latest new breakthrough of the suspect and, and everything has gone by the wayside and it will continue to. So probably 2025, I'll give another update on this and um, it'll be just as absurd. Um, regarding the Richard Hall interview, um, if you're not familiar with that, it's a, it's a great introduction, I think, to Statement Analysis 101. Um, Richard, in my opinion, did an excellent job of asking questions and allowing me to answer the questions based upon the McCann's language. Some of the, the simplest things uh, regarding that. He had very strong opinions on the case. He still does, I believe. But he didn't cause that to interfere with the interview. He wanted information from me, so what he did was he asked questions and he stepped back and, and let me answer them. And he allowed me to show it from the language itself. And so I, I think that um, if you go to his YouTube page, you can see that and how it was done. It's very different than what you're seeing, I think, with the uh, many of these interviews with Sebastian Robbins missing. But some of the principles just remain the same um, and transcend culture, for example because uh, paternal and maternal instinct is very powerful and we're able to read it. And so people are asking some of the same questions now of this particular missing case, this missing boy, that they did in the, in the McCann interviews, such as, hey, where's the concern for the victim? I hear all this concern about yourself, and but I don't hear the concern for the victim. And of course, when that gets public and it goes out there, um, another interview that can respond to that and then begin to, uh, we're going to see that here with the Sebastian Robbins case. That was, I believe, the case of John Benet Ramsey, where the father uh, changed his, um, his approach to media, you know, working with attorneys. And um, I think it showed a, a very strong awareness of what people were saying. And so sometimes that will influence. So going to earlier interviews are, is always best. And then once um, publicity hits and criticism hits, you can see sometimes people react. So let me just see if there's any questions that anyone has on that. Um, do you ever draw on personal experience or do you try to avoid it for fear of bias? Um, that's one of the, that's a great question. That's one of the points of working with others, of working with others that um, can keep you in check with that. Now, I have a lot of experience in interviewing a case for child abuse. Um, and I, I made a, what I think is rather a, a biased statement about um, Sebastian Robbins' stepfather. I said I interviewed him a hundred times. And what I mean by that is the, the, I didn't interview him at all. I've been there so many times with a step-parent or boyfriend who mirrored his language. So there is experience that I am drawing from that. Another another case I can, I can address with that also. And I think that... It, it's a little bit different when with law enforcement than non-law enforcement, but um, most people don't have a lot of experience investigating and interviewing for neglect cases, which is a good thing. You know, that, that um, it's like people will say, well, this church did not handle a sex abuse allegation very well. They had no experience in it, which is great. And that happens uh, generally. Uh, 
in a particular case we looked at, I had concluded that the um, mother did not cause the death, but neglect was in the language. And it, it wasn't terribly challenging to me because I've done it so many times. And what I mean about law enforcement, um, I mean, the, the those who respond early on, especially in child abuse cases, they walk in and they can see visibly neglect. They can see uh, an unsanitary house. And what I mean by unsanitary is not messy, but actually poses a risk to the child. And they hear a cavalier language that um, would almost be where, you know what, um, my kid is raising himself or herself, that sort of thing. And so even if they don't have um, training in that, they know it instinctively. They've just seen it too many times. So they understand that. And so um, that works well um, with law enforcement. <laughs> also, law enforcement, um, they reframe things humorously to try to survive an impossible job. Um, but chiefly, they don't generally wrestle or fight against human nature. They accept it for what it is. They, they experience it and they see it constantly. Um, they, they know and they grasp it. And so they, they're very easy to work with. Just um, once they get going, it, it really works well. So um, there's that. Okay, let me get to, if there's any more questions here on, on before I get to the, to the case. Um, the interview you analyzed with McCann's was from four years into the disappearance. Would it be more reliable to analyze early? Yes, it would have been more reliable. I did look at other material early on. Um, great question, Jerry. And it it was the same. It was the same. I think they were a little more cavalier uh, with time passing, and, and now they're at, they're downright challenging that sort of thing. And um, it wasn't a difficult analysis. And that's that's I, I've kind of emphasized that. Okay, then the the case. If there's no more questions on that, um, case of 15 uh, year old Sebastian Robbins went missing. The uh, mother, the, under the care of the mother and the stepfather. And so I think there's a lot there that I can, I can probably address. Second, please. And I've, I've made a couple of videos on this and um, I post on X more, some on Facebook, more on X. I've been posting less on the, the blog because of the censorship. I think it's been a lot of that over the last several years and it's become popular. But let me talk about this particular case and some of the language and um, I think taking questions yeah, on that would be really helpful about why I've concluded what I have concluded. What I've concluded is I don't know what happened to him. I believe that there was an altercation of some form between Sebastian and mother and that he either in under duress ran out of the house barefoot or she put him out. What happened when with the first interview that was given, um, people saw the step, stepfather being very controlling, uh, defensive. And I, I, um, Heather had said to me, uh, when she looked at that first one, she's like, she said something to the effect of, she wanted to say to the mother, blink twice if you're being held hostage. Somewhat humorously, but the idea being is that she's seen it before. Um, and I've talked about domestic violence. Now, he may have never hit her. But when you see his personality, you say, oh, she's very likely someone who lives under the threat of violence and controlled by it. So the first thing I noticed about it was um, it was a week before they spoke out. 
and people had posted. And I had one commentator on the YouTube channel that I took with permission her comment and shared it with everyone um, because it was just one of those strong accuracy level comments that should be shared. Um, I had said that if a child goes missing, the parents will do everything they can to get in front of the camera. They don't care about people's motives. They don't care about anything else, but getting the missing child out there. What that is, is a, is a character of the instinct to call out to the child. Now, they've called the child for dinner. They've called the child, where are you? If they heard a fall, are you okay? That's a natural human response. When a child is missing, that is stifled. And when they're given a means to call out to the child to fulfill that deep within them, they're going to take advantage of that. Why? Because their priority is finding the child. And so what we saw with this was there was, first of all, a delay of six or seven days of no crying out for the child. And the comment was, because um, I wasn't, I didn't go far enough. They should have been out there immediately, not only giving a description, that was my point, but this um, commentator's point was, and they should have been giving a, descript, uh, a strong description of his autistic behaviors because it could lead to an understanding of how he reacts to people and where he could be hiding. And uh, as many others have said, and it's sadly true that autistic children um, can be drawn to water for whatever reason. In this particular case, when they spoke, I concluded that um, they were withholding information, particularly the mother was withholding information and he was guiding and directing everything there. So they're, they're not candid, they're not truthful. Now, when she finally did speak more and he spoke freely, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that there wasn't enough there to say they know that he's not coming home. They didn't, um, this is early on now, they didn't indicate a guilty knowledge of death. Now, since that time, um, stepfather has, I believe, processed he's not coming home. Doesn't mean he killed him. But in the language, I did not see that blatant um, processing of the death, which is you know so unnatural for us that that we have this resistance and denial. Um, what I did see was someone that was very concerned with his image, very concerned with controlling. He also used some physicality in the language, which um, abusers do. And what people said, and they're very angry about that, is they heard him speak and they immediately went to, he did it because he is an abuser. They saw the defiance, they saw the challenges, they saw an utter lack of concern for Sebastian and all concern for himself and the image. And she did look like a hostage um, hiding or afraid. So I had concluded they're withholding information. They are coordinated in their responses. And you know, is that true or not true? Is it accurate, not accurate? After other... Um, Subsequent interviews, she began to speak a lot more. And she, for me, affirmed suspicions from the initial interview. So now I think most people understand, oh, they're definitely not telling the truth. They're, they're hiding information. And what she did specifically was she emphasized time. Time. Um, a little bit tricky to always pick up. But she emphasized time 
in her language, and, and this is where people said, look at these new details all of a sudden. And I became convinced as, as time expands in a statement that there was a delay in calling 911. And so what does that mean? And I called it significant. I should have explained that in a subsequent post. I gave a little more information on that. What I mean by a significant de delay, I'm not talking about significance in terms of the, the length of time, although I believe that it is, what my intention there was that I mean it was deliberate and it was coordinated. I think that she knew for hours and waited till 6 a.m. And then he did not call, she didn't call 911. Now, she was there. She would have the most crucial information. But he did the three-way call to the sheriff's department, which um, it to me, it, it gives an appearance of trying to control a narrative, which means the priority for me as the speaker is to control your perception of what happened rather than simply report what happened. What happened? Um, I think a, a number of you are talking about uh, anonymity in analysis. Um, it doesn't mean someone's doing poor work or, or whatever. It's just not the way I do things and, and that I engage in. So I, I, I'm not being critical of any one person. It's just that it, um, without knowing a background, without knowing who it is and being held accountable for answers like that, it's just I, just not something I work with. But I don't, I don't intend to throw shade on anyone else. A lot of people are very talented out there and they have great ideas. And I learn that every day in life. Um, and they may have some really good views on this case as well. So. Then um, as people were angry, and you can see this particularly in women that have suffered abuse themselves, they see in stepfather the anger the arrogance, what a bad combination, right? Um, the controlling nature and speculation just grows even beyond that. And then it becomes um, a type of moralism, uh, unnecessary moralizing, where um, people will turn to any source to alleviate some of the emotional distress that they feel over a stranger. So that you know, usually people with strong empathy and they care a great deal, um, but it often leads to chirping against each other and kind of a sectarianism. And uh, I'm on the the bandwagon. Uh, this person is good. This person is bad. The black hat versus the white hat, and the unnecessary moralizing eventually will lead to um, sniping one another. And so you see that in, in this case, and um, there's been some, uh, I think, you know, some discord that goes on and uh, something I like to avoid. And um, controversy within the searchers, that sort of thing. And I think anyone out there, you know, that's doing uh, searching is, is a help no matter what their motive. I don't really care about the motive. Um, they're out there. Um, some of the interviews, I, I think, have, have been very frustrating to watch because of the constant intrusion of an interviewer. Hey, you know, they don't have training. Um, and maybe that from this case, they'll learn and, and put out better videos where they let the person uh, with the information speak rather than feed them answers and that sort of thing. It, it's a little frustrating. And then you have the world of the psychics um, under any and different names and that sort of thing and the superstition that's involved with that. So I haven't analyzed a lot over the years. It's a waste of my time. Um, but a few times I did analyze because I was asked to and um, it may have been relevant in a case of someone that intruding. And there was a, a case that wasn't mine, but many years ago of a psychic who gave a really good description of a case because the psychic 
had committed the crime. So uh, you know, you, I don't want to dismiss it in the sense of, in case that comes up again, you, you don't want to be on guard for that, but I've never seen it since. But the um, their language does, shows deception. It doesn't come from experiential knowledge. And it generally uh, is associated with a pretty severe personality disorder where it comes from. So. All right, let me see if I get some of your questions. Oh, I wanted to address uh, Nina, Nina Gomez. Um, I don't know the person that did the interview, um, but I'd like to congratulate him. I didn't catch it all because it's very lengthy. He let her speak. She's the one with the information. He just let her speak. It was it was terrific that way. And so I listened to her and um, I found a lot of it to be reliable, reliable information, especially as, as she um, was not falling forward with emotion, but staying back and, and reporting uh, strong pronoun use, strong past tense use. There were some areas of missing information that is expected in this type of, of statement where she doesn't want to be responsible for things that she did. The hint into that was, you know, I did slap him. I did hit him. And, I, you know, I was thinking about that later. What she should have said is, yeah, I whacked him in the face. And all these years later, I wish I did it again and hit him harder or something, something honest like that. By owning one thing, what she's saying is that she did other things and she's embarrassed. She's ashamed that she was even with him and that she was controlled by him, and then humiliated with the family and that sort of thing. Um, so I, what I labeled that is reliable. I found that she was reliable, and because of her language. Um, what she did was confirm what probably all of you, myself included, saw in um, stepfather's language. It's like, yeah, she's describing the same person that we see doing interviews. And this guy can't stop himself. He's married five times. So what does he do? He gives out marital advice. He's a, an abuser. So what does he do? He gives out parenting advice. You know, he's, that's what I mean by classic abuser, a language that's easy to spot, a language that's consistent the need to control, um, the poor impulse control that he shows in interviews, uh, the demand that he be asked difficult questions and he different difficult questions and then he doesn't answer them, is a manipulator. Um, and I've I've seen the she described a stunt basically of tricking someone to try to take a child away, and I've seen it before. Um, in cases where, uh, especially against women, where a mother becomes distraught, uh, she's seeing a failing marriage. Um, the husband says, hey, you know, you need to just to reset maybe with your family. Go see your folks. And he buys a plane ticket and she goes and see the folks and then files for abandonment in the state he's in. It's not um, uncommon to see that sort of thing going on, it's cruel. Also, um, stepfather signaled that there was there's more um, child protective services involvement than he's letting on. I think that the uh, when child protective services get involved, they involved immediately, and there should be interview collateral interviews include pediatricians, teachers, coaches, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all across to get a big picture. A big picture. So when Nina spoke, she described a person that probably most of us have not met who matched the interviews he had given previously on, the, what you know, I called it the apology tour or um, to redeem my name or rehabilitate my name tour of interviews. And he made things way worse way worse. Um, do I think does he have a Messiah complex? He might. He might. I think he sees himself, uh, especially with the dis dispatching of inform, um, advice that he gives out. 
I think generally behind some of these things might be, for example, child support payments, money, the inordinate love of money. So, um, Psychics, when scientifically assessed, are seen to be no better than average. Um, my issue, especially with that, uh, is not only is the language indicating deception, but if you had a missing child, you would be, I would be utterly open to anything and to have someone of a predatory nature step in and then say, oh, I'm going to give you this answer. I'm going to give you that answer. You have no defense to that. I would have no defense to that. The vulnerability is is terrible. And if someone would take advantage of that, um, it takes a, a real selfish and I think personality disordered person who desperately needs to be seen as special. I'm different than every other human being. I uh, can ascertain information outside the senses, the normal communication of life. So maybe some more questions you have here. So, but Nina confirmed um, things that most people I think knew, people saw her in the, the videos. Is there anything in the interview that may make um, Nina guilty of the, of the interview? Now, I only saw half of it. It's very long. And the answer, no. Um, she was very much focused upon herself, her suffering, which is, which is contextually appropriate um, and difficult. Now, go to the question is, um, did they put him out of the house, mother? And you notice I say they. And I'm assuming that he was uh, not there, not at the time. I believe that was the phone call, the lengthy phone call. I mean, they can talk about anything they want to talk about. So what comes out is always going to be important to them. And then watching the two of them, and I am not dismissing uh, her as just an innocent victim of domestic violence. Um, I, I don't think that's an accurate description of her, but he is the controlling one. And um, based upon his language and things that we've learned about him, uh, I can very much see him threatening to leave her because of Sebastian's presence, um, going to make Sebastian a man. He, apparently he tried that with a three-year-old. Um, I think they're probably... Uh, I think charges are a long shot um, unless Sebastian is alive and can testify to his fears, to what happened that, that day. I think they may skate on it. Yeah, I, I, I found Nina just commenting on some of the things there. Be kind to each other. We all have different opinions. And you know what? I could be wrong in this case. Um, but I found Nina to be reliably reporting details. Um, during the parts where she became very emotional, um, which is interesting to me, that's where I find the least reliability and that's where people generally will see and say, oh, you know, she's got to be telling the truth. Look at um, her emotional response. And I, I, I can only listen to words. There are times when I used to interview people, especially women that might start crying, is I'd look away and I'd do my notes and not, not um, directly at the person. I was concerned that it would, it would influence me. And I don't want that. Other questions you may have? Um, someone wrote about um, mom was drinking and maybe put him outside. You know, they, they mentioned sleep there. Um, I wonder about that too. I don't know, but I wonder about it. 
I think his, um, and I, I know the descriptions of the teachers and others that have spoken, and there's a few things I know about the case that, that I can't talk about. Um, but I think that his, um, his autism was quite impactful. Um, some of you have asked about the the wearing of a, a diaper at his mother's house and not at his father's house. It was very upsetting. It's a, um, a very ugly red flag of concern. And that can be anything from um, the obvious sexual abuse as a child, all the way up to absolute anxiety and fear. And anything in between. So, you know, I don't know, but it was it was very concerning for that. I don't know anything in terms of the uh, the ongoing investigation. I'd like to trust the professionals in that. Um, however, um, emotionally invested I am or you are in this case, it is very likely not as much of the emotional investigation and most emotional investment by the uh, on the boots investigators have to solve this. I mean, there are cops that go home with this stuff and they'll put a picture of the missing boy right up in their home and just every day they live to, to solve, to bring justice. Um, and that I find to be more the norm. What do you think happened? Um, if you could put your conclusion. Now, some say that the my idea of him um, being put out, which is my first choice, my second choice is that he ran out under, under duress. Um, the objection to that is, well, it's been a month. How come they can't find its remains then? And um, it's more difficult than probably uh, we understand in terms, I, I don't know the topography there, but... Um, Something went wrong. Now, here's the third element there. Whether he was put out or ran off, could he have then befallen not just the, the elements there, but a stranger? Could a stranger have picked him up? And he met trouble there. That I don't know. Um, he would have been vulnerable to a predator picking him up, I agree, especially under that type of duress, even if he was afraid of strangers. Sometimes it's difficult to predict what someone will do in, in that 15-year-old uh, with blind fear. And uh, I, I do think that the some of the descriptions um, have been optimistic, you know, but maybe not accurate. You know, when there's a special needs child, and this is my own bias, and they come under the, the, the radar of Child Protective Services, and there's a stepfather or boyfriend involved, it's one you shake your head. You know, it's like, oh no, not this, not this one. The diaper is to humiliate Sebastian in order to subjugate him. That's certainly possible. You know, I list things in terms of as a question rather than an assertion, unless the language has given me certainty. But that's a good, you know, a good point. Um, any thoughts on the possible involvement of Chris's family? I, I do have some thoughts on that, and um, get a little glimpse into their demeanor and that sort of thing. especially uh, listening to his ex-wife. Someone had, had written recently, the other ex-wives should all be interviewed. I agree. Everything that, that gives a portrait of what um, Sebastian may have been living under is helpful. Um, would, uh, would you, if you had a step-grandchild, 
Would you not be involved from the very beginning to help find him? That can speak a lot. Um, transcripts and emails. Oh, yeah, let me, oh, I'm some, glad someone brought up about transcripts, and emails, and that sort of thing. So I, I apologize after our last video. I've had uh, overwhelming number of requests for different cases. And basically, it, the, the, the average is look at this video and tell, <laughs> tell me what you think. I can't. Um, and it's just too much for even to, to dish off onto to team members. Um, you'd have to submit a transcript. The transcript has to be accurate to look at. And then I have to still triage that and see who's free, who's not free. So um, a number of you have not gotten answers and I apologize for that. It's just, it's too many, it's too many. I shouldn't have made that, that statement. Well, I was really referring to this case, um, but uh, got a lot of things on that. Um, okay, so another thing um, regarding food, just keep that note down, uh, food and, and Sebastian, um, she did indicate that it was a, a sugar diet, basically, um, which I believe, I'm not a medical doctor, but I believe is just uh, not only uh, not indicated for good health, but especially impactful upon someone with autism. Um, my nickname for it is the glucose roller coaster, up and down, up and down like that, and the constant uh, hunger. And someone had asked a question, um, which seemed to really offend a uh, stepfather. Do you have a lock on your refrigerator door? And some families have to do that at night. Um, and there's in different places, it's viewed in terms of um, rights, rights violation, that sort of thing. Um, families that I've known that have done that were not trying to starve a child or to violate someone's rights, but trying to protect the child from himself or herself. Of course, someone can do that to, to starve someone and be cruel, but it's not always the case. It was a legitimate and a good question. And um, he was offended by it. So my guess about that is, is that there have been some significant issues over food. And we have, in terms of a stepfather, a really angry person, an angry person, a person of anger, um, someone that I would never want around my children or grandchildren. Could his body, could his remains still be on the property? Um, I don't think too close as they continue to search and search. So, I know a number of you have mentioned Sumner Wells and that tragic case. I did work on that case and I, I think I've done a video or two on it as well. Mother was deliberately withholding. She was deceptive about what took place just before she was reported missing. Father, as most of you saw, used the language of a sexual abuser. It wasn't there for that. Um, so I do had, you know, and then continue to have fears that um, she met a tragic ending, that she could have been kidnapped by, uh, in revenge by drug dealers. She could have been trafficked. You know, I, I don't know what happened to her, um, but mom was deceptive and uh, dad was a, a, a prison mess. I thought the behavioral panel did an excellent job um, in analyzing the father's body language and, and some of the language too, in terms of someone that has been in prison and someone that uh, is coming from a, that unique context. Yeah, I, so I think that, that um, dad teaching him to be a man, and I, and I say that uh, facetiously, I think dad had issues with Sebastian having any type of autonomy. Um, and he may not have been able to be trusted with food at age 15, but that type of personality of stepfather, and I mean dad, I meant stepdad, 
that personality of stepfather would be to perceive not that he's having this um, craving for sugar, but he's defying me. Me with all the experience in marriages and child raising, that sort of thing. Um, he's he what what stepdad sees in the mirror is not what everyone else sees. Um, Chris actually said, if we had gone out of the window, we would have heard him. I think that the uh, instinctive use of the pronoun we is not appropriate there. I think what he's referring to, so that's a great observation. Someone just made that. I think what he's referring to is the coordinated language, the coordinated story. Um, always best is the truth. Always best is the truth. But there's consequences for the truth. Longer term, um, it'll be difficult to see these people staying together. Um, he seems to kind of be a serial person who wants to, to serially marry all the time. Um, and I think that she might end up just despising him, despising him. Um, the dad, Seth, I know about the accusations from years ago. What's important to ask about that is adjudication. How did that end? How did the allegations end? Um, it was routine in any type of divorce case that each side would make abusive uh, allegations. And then it came time to have some discernment. It, it's where my training was so valuable for me to, to listen to those things. But eventually I learned to avoid advocates because an advocate, especially um, female to female, would would write out an affidavit for the mother and guide her and pile on. I got to get this mother safe. I, you know, I understand the motive. I got to keep this kiddo safe. And she would pile on things that weren't true. And so I, it was one particular case that, that I, I wish I could forget, but um, a judge Um, looked at the case and the judge took the advocates. I knew the advocate had written out the affidavit uh, at her word. And the portrayal was of the father being so dangerous that he was ordered no contact at first. And then later it was going to be supervised visitation. Mom let him back in the house. Judge removed the baby from the house based upon the previous testimony. So even when she was saying, no, that's not true, it's not true, these are things you attested to. And, I, and now that you've lied in court, how can I discern that? This is the baby's going to a relative, that sort of thing. Um, they put in some really impossible positions. Um, I wonder if CPS told him to leave the home because of the abuse. Um, it's possible. Uh, what Child Protective Services do is if they believe that one person is responsible for the abuse, and generally it's the male, they will enter into a written agreement. We won't move to take custody from you, mom, if all of you agree that he is not to live here um, and he's to get you know, anger management or that sort of some kind of intervention in that. And then if he breaks the agreement, we have to come and petition the court for custody. So those written agreements, they go under different names. Um, this is one of the reasons I believe that stepdad has more involvement than he's saying. And I, I would like to interview or see the other ex-wives interviewed just to give that portrayal of what it was like for Sebastian. Yeah, the, um, someone said, I, I think he showed himself so much in that long video, he could not control himself, even just basic questioning. I, I agree. Um, 
And that's why I say what he sees in the mirror and what you see on the, the screen are two different things. He comes away from those things confident, and somehow he thinks that anger is helping him. I don't think he can control it. The long interview, um, and I didn't make that one either, is where someone nervously kept feeding him answers and that sort of thing. And so what I've had to do as I'm listening to that is discard this part of the answer. You know, so he's got this part of the answer is echoing the interviewer's words. Then he graciously went off on his own and kept going generally beyond the bounds of a question. And so as he's speaking for himself, that's where I'm drawing information from. So I generally av avoid the areas, even an interview of uh, emotionalism. It can be very manipulative, it can influence us. I just want the words. That's why transcripts, transcripts are so healthy. They look upon the words that someone chooses, uh, whether they're under duress or if they're being manipulative. I wanna hear those words. Uh, isn't he a narcissist? Um, so I, I'm not qualified to uh, diagnose. He's narcissistic. So that's a kind of a fair description, I think. Very narcissistic. Um, someone's asking about the Sumner Wells case. Was Don allowed to live on the hill with precious four kiddos? I, I don't know what happened after that. There hasn't been uh, much inf information. I think some of you saw the interview where uh, he shared a bed with a little girl. You know, and some are really good at the body language. I'm not one of them. You know, I have an opinion on those things, but uh, um, I, I I do. Even to this day, when I, I still do some interviewing, I look away. I, I Sometimes I joke in trainings, I was raised with seven sisters. It's a lot of oxytocin. That's a lot of emotion. And I don't want to be influenced by that if I can help it. And so I look away and take notes. In joint interviews, which I enjoy very much, I love to um, be in the background and, and take notes and give real thought and consideration to the words. Sadly, I you know, I, I don't have an opinion on whether Sebastian is still with us or not in the sense of any language. I believe stepfather has processed that death in the language, but that's changed over the course of a month. And um, in terms of there's a, there's a hierarchy, mothers are the last to accept the death. Um, I was thinking of one case from years ago um, where the stepmother had killed the uh, little boy. And the mother, years later, was still in present tense about him. Just absolutely no ability to accept that he's not coming back. This is, you know, years later, also years ago. Um, so you have mother, and, and assuming a, a father's in the house, a biological father, he's going to be next uh, on, that, on that resistance level. But a step father can be down a bit. And if there was um, contention as there was in this household, um, he's gonna move quickly to process that. He wasn't emotionally invested in Sebastian. And I think probably everyone saw that. On and on and on he went about himself, 
nothing about what Sebastian was going through, nothing about the darkness, nothing about the cold, nothing about bare feet, nothing about food, nothing about anything. I think the only thing he mentioned was meds and that I didn't like because that would be very likely psychotropics, my guess. And if so, it may have been some form of chemical restraint that he approved of, you know, controlling his behavior, that sort of thing, or amphetamine. So I didn't like that that portion of him. That, that was disturbing. But I think the general observation that I have and that probably everyone here has is that his care was for himself, not for Sebastian. And if you, it, and I didn't do this, but if you type his words into a computer and do the math, you'll see that. Um, someone's asking for a repeat of an old story. Um, yeah, there was a time where uh, someone who was visibly uh, pity arousing who had accused a, a young man of rape and I had to turn away because um, it was churning a, a real emotion in me. It was, it was, it was very difficult. And then she, after the alleged sexual assault, she went to the pronoun we, which shares cooperation, unity with the alleged rapist. And that saved me from terrible error. Eventually, I uh, did confront her that she wasn't truthful. And I was very concerned and I, I was concerned about her mental health and how she might react. And, and she surprised me by reacting um, very callous, in a very callous way, blaming him for breaking up with her. And I, I often think back, like, oh man, if I didn't have training, I could have been on the bandwagon to help put some innocent young man in jail. You know, and I, I uh, regarding this missing young boy's case, I don't mean to impose my view upon anyone, um, and I could be wrong, and it could be something uh, far more nefarious. It's just my opinion based on the language, but I'm certainly open to other opinions and um, what others may think. But right now, I'm at the point of um, they had a reason not to call. 911 directly, not to call 911 immediately, to withhold information. They're coordinated together. Um, and I'm assuming that he was out of town and not in. And so I'm thinking that special needs, combative stepfather away for quite some time, that he may have ordered or directed mother to put him out. We'll show him. We'll teach him. And he didn't come back. Or something went so wrong and, and was so upsetting that he ran off, including without the, the shoes, if, if that's true or not. Again, I only know what I read in the in the paper. Someone's asking, what was the motive for um, JonBenet Ramsey? I don't think it was premeditated. I think someone lost their temper, someone was wound too tight, and they were in it together. They were deceptive from the beginning. Um, their behavioral analysis and the statement analysis match someone that did not want to be caught. People are afraid of consequences. You know, I, I still believe the same thing about the McCanns, that it was born of neglect, and I think that they were sedating her, to use a polite word, uh, in some means so they can go out and dinner. And when 
someone goes into survival mode for themselves, it, it can appear to be almost sociopathic, the, the lack of concern. Right? They're trying to survive themselves. They can say to themselves, we got two other kids. If we tell them what we did, you know, with cough syrup or, or something stronger, then they're going to take the other ones away. So those, those are both cases. I don't think it was premeditated in that sense. One, I think, was a lost temper. And the other one was a selfish, we're going out to dinner mentality. I know some people see a lot more into that. Um, I just don't see it in terms of the language. Um, John Bonet Ramsey was sexualized. It may, as culture it continues to shift, it may not seem as shocking anymore or because people have seen the pictures. Um, but she was, as a little girl. And I think, I think that she was under a lot of pressure. Um, regarding Sebastian, uh, do you think there was abuse happening in the home? I do. I certainly do. I wonder if that had something to do with him not being in the home as of late. The tent, whether tension or threatening to leave her, that sort of thing. But a guy in his fifth marriage, I don't think would really grant any security to the woman that he's going to stick around and not shoot for number six. Um, the mom said she heard a thud at 10 p.m., which is interesting. It is very interesting. Remember, if I said to you, what did you do this morning? You can choose anything you want to say. If you give some detail, that is a little bit unusual. Um, first of all, whatever you give, I want to go to. But if it's unusual, even more so. So I don't think there was any um, motive for killing. I think it was probably an accidental death and then a, a, a really foolish cover-up with a, a fraudulent ransom note um, with some passive aggressiveness by the author towards John, the father. I find his behavior despicable in terms of going um, into the crime world and having pictures taken with him and that sort of thing, just, just horrible. Um, I can't. Uh, have you seen the flyer picture? Sebastian seems to have bruises around his throat. I'm not sure if those are bruises. It's difficult to tell. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. With a special needs child, um, there can be an explosion. Um, how did Sebastian's mom pass the polygraph? I'm guessing, it's just my guess, that she was asked questions, you know, your name, ad, excuse me, address, you know, a couple of control questions, and then asked, do you know where he is? No, pass. Um, did you cause his death or harm? No, pass. Not was there an altercation? Was there an argument? Um, did you put him outside? Did he run off? Did you see him run off? That sort of thing. This is why um, when you see the um, interviews unfolding with more and more detail, and you see uh, for many of the interviews, stepfather is absolutely in charge. And then he, after the criticism, he starts backing off and allowing her to speak more. Um, you get the, the sense that um, The language is coordinated, coordinated. You know, with, you have to be careful with photographs um, in terms of even shadows and that sort of thing. So I don't know um, if there were bruises, I would not be surprised. Um, but how long, how old were they? How long, how long were they there? That sort of thing, it can be difficult. I worked with some um, forensic doctors on cases like that. Trying to date bruises is tricky. 
one of the things you have to know is about nutrition uh, of the of the victim and helping to date the the bruises. Um, how do I feel about polygraph tests? Um, I think they're very useful. I like when parents of a missing child will immediately volunteer for it and insist, sometimes in some cases, insist upon it. Um, for a polygraph to give a good indication, um, the polygraph examiner must use the language of the subject, himself or herself. Do not introduce new language, that sort of thing. Um, it can be a real tool towards moving along. When there are certain topics that are they're different, contextually different, the sexual abuse of a child is one of those such topics where someone can pass a polygraph because they're not using the subject's own language. And one of the examples I've given over the years is someone who passed a polygraph being asked if he sexually abused uh, his girlfriend's daughter. He uses the word tickle, not sexual abuse. So he may not have that reaction, that physiological reaction to sexual abuse as he would have to tickle. So in terms of, of that sort of thing, it's it's important to really be uh, well-trained in that and use the language that the person uses. Don't introduce new language. Were they getting government aid for Sebastian? I don't know. What do you think of that parents who were not there? when the child went missing, answering all the questions. You know, I'd be concerned, and, and this is the case here, where a stepdad is answering all the questions, is a coordinated story, controlling the narrative, protecting self. Um, I suspect John Ramsey killed a sexualized daughter to cover up a sexual assault by him. Patsy had covered up his image, vital to her then, certainly possible. There are things in his language that, that are very concerning to me. Um, Chris stated there were three different reports about a belt and blamed Sebastian for making multiple statements about one incident. He disparaged the victim while the victim is missing. I mean, he used the word liar at one point. That was very disconcerting. So that's where I had seen it, even in the original interview, there is coordinated language. Where there's coordinated language, what is of interest to me is that there's a need for coordinated language. Whereas experiential language, you just say what you remember. When we uh, analyze witness statements, we understand there's different perspectives, how they react. I had told a story of, of, um, of abuse of a man with uh, adult autism and mental retardation where there were two staff members present and both made statements. The one said that the other staff punched him in the head repeatedly. And the one that was accused, he made a statement in which he said that, and I'm not sure if this language is still used anymore, but he used to give him a noogie to calm him down. And had worked with him for years. Both statements were truthful. Both statements were reliably given. So which is it, assault or um, type of play? And what had happened was uh, I had concluded they're both telling the truth. So how does it work? In subsequent interviews, the one staff that said it was an assault had been a victim of domestic violence herself and just went into PTSD mode. And the other one that had been accused had been working with this uh, 
fella for years, and they were very closely bonded. And so there's there's always a need to go further and deeper. Uh, please feel free to, to disagree with any of this. Um, it doesn't offend me, and uh, I don't know at all here. I, I do encourage you to, to look for articles that have quotes, interviews where they're allowed to speak. And I, I think that's coming to an end now where they're, um, it hasn't worked out the way they wanted to, um, but also different theories. And hopefully we got an answer. I just am not optimistic about justice because if he can't testify, And a short of a confession, which would tie both of them together, because if, if stepdad insisted you do this and then she did it, they're both responsible. And something they'll have to live with. So if there are any other questions, I'll wrap it up here. I'll just leave another minute now for the questions. Um, do you think a detective would probably be clearing suspects in a missing child case? No. No, I think he, I think he plays pretty fast and loose with truth, referring to the uh, the stepfather. Some have asked uh, about the uh, biological father. Why wasn't he out from the very beginning speaking? I don't I don't have an answer for that. Um, the with the the theory of um, the mother doing something to cause his death, she would likely fail a polygraph if she's asked, um, you know, "Is your son alive?" That sort of thing, or something in those means. But it becomes a question of then um, where to dispose remains. And what I mean about the people asking about that, um, you look for someone front and center in the in the camera. Uh, he's out, obviously now spending all of his energy searching and um, publicizing his name. I know a lot of people thought that uh, he was certain that Sebastian is alive and that type of confident assertion that looks to me to be more uh, of an attempt to persuade himself. So his suffering is, is uh, more than I can understand. Um, how do the, we as viewers absorb all the information responsibly without causing more chaos in the investigation? I'm not sure that that there is much of an impact on the investigation when people speculate. It, you know, it, it once the emotions kick in, sometimes logic is out the window. Um, you know, people are posting direct messages to Sebastian or condemning each other for different views and that sort of thing. Um, it is completely unnatural for humans to not engage in seeking to understand a mystery. We've been created to do that. So if there's a mystery that's presented, people are going to speculate. And if your goal is to find your stepson, you don't care. You don't care. Um, what he said was um, every time someone makes a false claim, it has, takes a body away from the searching, which is nonsense. It's not true. It's him trying to control what people think, which is insight into what Sebastian experienced. So, you know, I don't like to get involved with all the, the uh, whenever I see the hypermoralism, the emotionalism in the language, I don't like to get involved with that. Um, but those that claim that it's harming the investigation, or the, 
I'm not so sure of the, the strength of those claims. It, it seems more like um, if you disagree with me, you're hurting him. People used to write that years ago about Madeline McCann that I was upsetting her. It's like, you think the missing child is following my videos or my analysis on a blog somewhere? You know, of course, I don't I don't say those things because it's they're, they're usually someone's very emotionally upset by that. Um, but it's it's not logical. And once we cross into the emotional area, it becomes very difficult to to stay clear of those things. And I think that that lesson uh, of the last four years of the Western world, where fear completely nullifies logic for for many, many people. I think we, we have a better understanding of that now. So I'm not, I'm not concerned and people can bicker. And th I think this is somewhat uh, Seth's point. They can bicker all they want. Just keep searching. That's all. And I, I recognize there are those that are uh, sensationalistic about it. And they say some outrageous things um, to gain attention or whatever. Um, but even if someone intends to get subscribers or viewers or whatever, and they're getting the name out, hey, you know what? They're getting the name out. I'm glad. They're getting the picture out, that sort of thing. So, I, you know, I, I, it's been a long time. It's, it's, I think, very difficult for anyone to maintain hope. I think for Seth, it's, it's his way of surviving. And I think that every one of us that thinks that harm befell him would celebrate wonderfully that we were wrong. It's just the, the nature of people like that. But it's been a long time, and I don't think he was capable of survival. So, thank you for joining. I apologize for how long this was. It was a bit much. I, I didn't want to skip any questions, or, or I wanted to allow other theories to come out. Um, last one um, about him calling directly to the sheriff's department, calling 911. It bothers me. Thank you all, and um, hopefully we'll still have less cases to update, but uh, when the cases do break, I'll, I'll try to address more in video format. So there's Paul. Paul, if you could leave your contact information, um, I think that's always helpful, especially uh, scheduling uh training sessions for uh, UK time. I'm long asleep by then, but uh, I think that'd be helpful. So if, if Paul could, he does excellent work. So thank you all, take care.